So good afternoon, everybody. We are joined by quite a number of people here on the IMM DG Masterclass, and uh, also some people have joined through the YouTube link. So welcome everybody to the lecture for the month of August, and we have today with us Dr. Ekta Gupta. Uh, she is professor and head department of clinical virology at Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences. And uh, since the institute has been working with a lot of transplant patients and with a lot of rare viruses and other diseases, uh, Dr. Ekta, I consider to be the most apt person to take this talk on transplant associated infections. So, um, a warm welcome to Dr. Ekta, and I'll hand over the proceedings to you now. Good evening, everyone. Um, I think I'm audible, and you can see the screen also. Yes, yes. Okay. So thank you, uh, Dr. Sonal, for giving me this wonderful opportunity and sharing a little bit of experience on transplant-associated infections. I bring to you all greetings from the Institute of Liver and Biliary Sciences. Uh, are the slides moving? I think I should up something. I'll share the slides again. Try to move the slide now. They were moving earlier, but I don't know. Uh, make it in a non-presentation mode, maybe then it will move. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, I'm sorry for this. I will share again. Can you the slides now? Yeah, now it's visible. Try to move your cursor to the next slide. Okay. Can you see it moving? Yeah, now it's moving. Okay. So I'll try to put it again onto the. So I think it is moving now, right? Okay. Uh, it's moving, it's okay. moving very well. Now the uh, so to uh, I'll start the lecture. The basic percepts of infections in a transplant setting is that the infections they occur on a time scale. So uh, they do not occur like anything in the common. We have to be careful about that. What is the duration and time since the transplant? It also matters on what is the type of the transplant, whether it is solid organ or it is bone marrow. And in solid organ, the lung has got highest chances because of it depends upon the exposure to the external and the colonization of your uh, epithelial tract lining. So lung, liver, heart and kidney. More the surgery, more is the infection. As we know that liver requires a lot of uh, uh, surgery. And so that is why the chances of lung and liver has got in more infections is there. More the immunosuppression, more is the infection. And one thing is that the typical sign and symptoms of infections are often diminished and they vary. So there is a delicate balance between a lot depends upon the type of microbe which is causing how it is inoculated, how the exposure has occurred, what is the virulence of that, and whether it is a latent pathogen or not. Then a lot depends upon the host immune, uh, immune system. There is an artificial immunosuppression created, so the adaptive immune responses are halted, I mean, uh, uh, are affected. Along with it, if there is a hamper on a lot of mucosal or a lot of skin damage has occurred, then in fact, your other innate, other immune responses are also hampered. So the infections depend upon the host status also. Uh, the entire mechanism to control uh, infections depend upon this immunosuppression, which is very, very important. So there is a delicate. So once the transplant is done, there is an outside organ in our body. You, The body tries to reject it. So the most natural defense is rejection. Now, in order to prevent that rejection, you give immunosuppression. When you immunosuppress the individual, that 
creates environment for infection. And few infective organisms are also immunomodulatory, which further causes a rejection for which you have to again increase the immunosuppression. So there is always an interplay between infection, rejection, and immunosuppression. So knowing the immunosuppression for any lab person who's reporting this infection is also very, very important. That is why I just wanted to capture what are the most common immunosuppressive agents and combinations which used during the solid organ transplants or transplants. Steroids, definitely. Now these are, uh, so basically your, uh, we are working on the cell mediated immune responses. So the proliferation of T cells is there, activation occurs, and then they lead into uh, the activated T lymphocytes, which go and target the pathogen. Now, steroids, they act on, they uh, inhibit the production of IL-1. There are calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporin and tacrolimus, which are very commonly used. They prevent its activation into the activated state, and your DNA synthesis by your purine and these analogs which inhibit the purine uh, production like your uh, azathioprine and microphenoic acid. Usually a combination of three is given and then it is tapered and a long-term one and most commonly it is the tacrolimus which is a calcineurin inhibitor which is used. So basically your cell mediated immune responses are in, uh, affected and which creates a good atmosphere for the intracellular pathogens to cause. Now, uh, that is why the infection depends upon the host state, the level of immunosuppression. That is why I said that it is very important to understand that there is a timeline of infection. In the timeline, the and this is a typical Rubin criteria. Now it is slightly revised. Earlier it was known as Rubin's criteria. Now it is uh, uh, revised. First month or less than one month is often surgical because there is a lot of damage to mucocutaneous sites. So it is a surgical site infection. So bacterial infections predominantly occur here. Or if there is any other infection, which is already there in donor and recipient, which gets activated. So first month is basically bacterial. First to six months is the state, and here a uh, lot of body stress is there. So the immune, although the immunosuppression is intense, but for this immunosuppression to settle in takes about more than a one month. So one to six, your immunosuppression is cell mediated are totally gone, and so the reactivation of the underlying colonizers, and this is the time where herpes, group of viruses, and other pathogens they activate. More than six months, more or less, the patient's body has got adjusted to this immunosuppression. They go out in the community, they start mingling. So the community-acquired infections are the key for more than six months. So understanding which phase your patient has come for a test is very, very important to uh, lead to a diagnosis of infection. In bone marrow and uh, hemopoietic, that is hemopoietic stem cells, slightly difference is there than the solid organ transplant because you prepare the body for a pre-engraftment, which is usually three weeks earlier to a transplant. And here, a lot of myeloablative or immunoablative or cytoablative treatment is given. So there's a lot of mucosal damage, intense neutropenia. So the uh, bacterial infection uh, is predominantly and a lot of bacterial infections occur, unlike the solid organ trans, uh, uh, transplants where the viral infections are usually most common. However, in uh, bone marrow also, the viral infections predominate, uh, uh, causing infection. So if you look at the list of the pathogens, the viruses top the list in causing infections in a transplant setting in a longer term one month, one to six months, and later on also, followed by bacterial, fungal, and parasitic. So I'll be more focusing on the viral infections. And the common viral infections are the opportunistic one, which are already there as a latent. So the reactivation of latent viruses, which have formed that uh, any lining, respiratory, GI tract lining, or which are they inside the cells, they reactivate and they are the culprit for most of the infections. Community acquired infections occur because there's uh, 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 is less, but that respiratory tract viruses predominate or the viruses which have a potential to cause outbreak like HEV, dengue, they can cause uh, fatal outcomes in the transplant community. 
there are certain organs specific, like for example, in liver, there is hepatotropic viruses. So their persistence can be there. Their recurrence can occur because per se for the site where it is transplanted. So there are organ specific viral infections. Broadly, we divide the course of a transplant into a pre-transplant phase where the person has to be one, once a microbiologist has to be very careful to understand infections in the recipient, infections in the donor. Then how the transplant phase, how the surgery has taken place, a lot of blood has been used, a lot of, uh, you know, you know uh, it, it was a gross surgery, a long so the ICU stay was long, so the risk of infections become more. Post-transplant, I told you, if intense immunosuppression, multiple combinations are going on, uh, and the, there are certain other factors like exposures and exogenous, endogenous, then a person has. So one has to, the microbiologist, while reporting, not only has to take care of the time, but also has to understand pre-transplant, transplant, and post-transplant factors if you are doing a diagnosis. Pre-transplant screening is a very, very important uh, aspect and that's why the microbiologist's good role in screening comes because what is the objective of this pre-transplant screening? We want to identify exposure, which is occurring in the recipient and uh, donor for infection, presence of any latent infections. We want to identify ongoing infections which require treatment. So idea is that any ongoing treatment try to give correct antiviral before transplant if it is an elective transplant and try to reduce the burden of that uh, the pathogen as low as possible. If you cannot just totally cure it, it should be as minimal as possible. If there are vaccinations available, for uh, uh, then we should give pre-transplant vaccination, vaccination for influenza, vaccination for hepatitis A virus, vaccination for pneumococcal vaccinations, hepatitis B vaccination. All these are recommended when we are uh, looking and doing a screening. And if we see that the recipient is not vaccinated, uh, uh, then we always try to uh, advise for the vaccination. So the complete evaluation of a recipient and donor is done. Now the challenges we face. Ideally, identifying the type of test. So you have to explain to your clinical friends what are the tests. So if they order IgM or PCR, then that will tell you about active ongoing infection only. That is needed because you have to control the infection. But if you really want to study the exposure or categorize the risk of donor and recipient, that it is the IgG test which you really need to order. And especially for the latent viruses. Very, very careful interpretation of test has to be done. So pre-transplant risk categorization is usually done for latent viruses like CMV, EBV, herpes. So these are the three important uh, pathogens and VZV, uh, which we do for risk categorization. We uh, consider risk category post-transplant if the donor is positive for an exposure, now these are IgG-based assays. So when I'm writing D positive, R negative means donor was IgG positive, recipient is never exposed. This becomes high risk because when you transplant anything from this donor to recipient, this will give you a de novo primary infection, which can be, which will not be controlled by the body. So it can be disseminated, will have uh, severe consequences. When you, the donor and recipient both are exposed or recipient is exposed, then it gives an intermediate risk because only a reactivation can occur or a reinfection. Primary, the donor is already exposed, so the primary infection will not occur. Low risk category if both are negative. Yes, still there is a risk of transferring infections through blood and uh, blood products, through uh, iatrogenic transmission. So there are other factors by which the infection can be transmitted. So one has to be careful. We use uh, leukodepleted blood for such patients so that the CME is not transplanted. So these are risk categorization methods. I'll just tell you what is the importance of sequential testing. So one has to be careful that IgG is telling you exposure, but there are certain IgG tests which you carefully have to do and do sequential testing. Now, this is a case report interesting, which we often get such cases that a young adult who came and a liver transplant was offered. So within three months, he got HBV infected. Frank, you know, Frank HBV infection was there. 
pre-transplant recipient was surface antigen negative and IgG exposure in the form of the was never exposed, never got infected. Pre-transplant donor was a surface antigen negative. However, there was a core total positive. Now, the microbiologist could have left this scenario, would have ignored it or whatever happened. This could have been a potential source of transmission. So what were the sources? Yes, the donor, because the donor showed exposure and the recipient did not show. Recipient could have been in a stage that the core total antibodies were minimally detective. So reactivation, blood, blood product could give de novo or it could be an hydrogenic. What did we miss? We missed that you should have got the HBV DNA done in the donor. So certain and anti-HBAs in the recipient as well as the donor. The donor could have been exposed and now cleared. So an anti-HBAs, which is a protective type, should have been done. Here I want to tell you is that when I say that risk, is, risk exposure is done by IgG, you don't have to leave certain IgG just like that. You have to do a sequential testing. Idea is try to uh, give as minimal exposure to a recipient for any infection as possible. So here the microbiologist opinion and advice is very, very important. Now, so this was about pre-transplant screening and role. Now post-transplant, when the diagnosis of infection comes, one has to be careful about what is the timetable, which I have said. Now, mind it, you don't have to depend upon the Western literature for your timeline because the infections, the amount of occurrence differs from the developing to the developed. It also may differ from one like Delhi, to, uh, which is a north uh, city in the north India, to the city which is there in the south India. So ideally, each center should develop their own timeline, should understand what is happening, should develop their own testing and monitoring uh, algorithm based upon the data they generate. So one do, we do not have to fall back on the Western. They give you a broad uh, timeline, but you all have to develop in your each center what is important when you're doing a post-transplant surveillance for infection. One has to be very, very careful about exposure. Like right now in Delhi, in post-monsoon, uh, uh, dengue outbreak is happening. So I'm not going to wait. Uh, so the source of transmission to a transplant infection can be the healthcare workers also. And uh, so one like the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak was there, the uh, influenza outbreak goes on. So the, if we, I just wait that the recipient did not go out into the community, but the healthcare worker could have transmitted even during the first month. So one has to be very, very careful if there are any outbreaks happening in that uh, city at that time or that place at that time, or in, in your own institute anything is abnormal is happening. Typical sign and symptoms are often obliterated, so a high degree of suspicion is always there. And one has to be extremely careful in identifying colonization, infection, or an active disease. And there, that is why the cutoff value, and that is why a lot depends upon the PCR, which gives you quantitative results. So identifying what is the cutoff threshold value beyond which we will say that it is now crossing colonization looks like an infection. The important why I'm not going cannot touch in uh, everything here in this short span of time, but important viruses I'll speak. Uh, cytomegalovirus is in a very very important virus which is ubiquitous and can cause so many things in a transplant recipient. Um, it can cause infection anywhere. It is a DNA virus belonging to the herpes viridae family. Usually the exposure occurs to all of us during most of us during the first year of life where you have suffered from mild subclinical infectious mononucleosis like illness, but then it goes and uh, gives you a lifelong latency into the cells of all the myeloid lineage. In developing nation, the exposure means IgG seroprevalence has been found to be more than 95% than the Western world where it is just 50 to 60%. So what happens, as I said, that the virus goes, resides into the monocyte, becomes latent, but whatever uh, stress, surgery, rejection, co-infection, anything by which the body inflammation occurs, especially the TNF alpha and NF kappa B, they cause promote, uh, they stimulate the early, uh, immediate early gene of CMV and they start the CMV replication within the cells. 
Now, once this within the cells it is there, it comes out, the DNA increases, and then we call this as CMV infection. So CMV infection is per se just detection of CMV DNA in the blood or presence of antigen in the blood or by culture-based detection of CMV inside the blood. It has got nothing to do with the disease, but once it causes a certain threshold, it starts giving you sign and symptoms, which can be very minor like fever, thrombocytopenia or tissue invasive disease. We start calling it CMV disease. We have few definitions. So CMV infection, I told you, is just the presence or replication, which could be DNA antigenemia. We call it disease, which can be divided into two groups, CMV syndrome. 60 to 70% of time, it is just a syndrome. The disease is just a syndrome where you have non-specific symptoms like fever, malaise, fatigue. So we call it a syndrome. End organ diseases when a particular site is characteristically involved. It can be CMV pneumonia, CMV retinitis, CMV GI tract infection. There you have to prove its presence in that tissue and then, then we call it a end organ disease. The CMV has got its effect in terms of the direct effect, which we see that it can cause all these because of the replication, it can call all these direct effects. But apart from it, it also causes a lot of indirect effect, means it also starts stimulating the uh, rejection. It creates, a, uh, so it's immunomodulatory, so it causes more opportunistic infection. It also has interactions with EBV replication and leads to uh, in its outcome. Now, what is uh, the exact time for occurrence? Now, in the Western world, as you can clearly see, they say that anything two to six months is the time for CMV disease. But this is our Indian uh, literature where we have found in the liver, it is very, very early. This is a study by Apollo Group. This is our own study. Within 30 days, we have started seeing few centers, they only screen after three weeks. So uh, uh, that is why they have not seen. So the very early screening has to be started. In renal transplant, they give an induction therapy and a prophylactic therapy is given to most of the recipient. And that's why there is a delay in occurrence. So uh, in our experience, we have published few and we've collected a lot of data. I can tell you that the, pre, the exposure to CMV in our population is 90 to 98 percent almost very high and occurrence is a pro a cmv infection is approximately 30 percent so 30 percent will have dna although the disease or syndrome is seen only in 10 percent and tissue invasive disease is still rarer with a very good surveillance service uh, which is available it's one to two percent but the median time of occurrence of cmv in our center we have seen is within first month it starts occurring especially the median is 10 as early as 10 days to 20 to 22 days post transplant pediatric P uh, cases they show much early reactivation and we've also done a couple of studies that what is the pre-transplant igg levels or any cell mediated immune responses yes they have shown good potential but uh, they're still not in the guidelines. So how do we do diagnosis? As in a transplant uh, recipient, you know it is immunosuppressed. So your uh, all your serology assays like IgG, IgM can be false, uh, positive, negative also. So we do not depend upon IgM assays for infection. We depend upon viral load. Uh, shell wild culture or viral culture, they are cumbersome, so still they do not have any role. Cornerstone of diagnosis is a viral load assay, and now with the RT-PCRs available, this is the most important test we do. Usually it is preferred over antigenemia, which was uh, quite a time, a decade back was considered as a better method, but uh, because it requires whole blood, you cannot, you have to do it immediately and it's observer specific. A lot of uh, literature has come which has shown RT-PCR to be a very important uh, method. WHO has now given international uh, reference standards. So all the reports have to be given in international units per ml. This was one infection which was earlier used to be reported in copies per ml. And now since because of this international, which gives it a uniform approach. So if a patient has 
got a, uh, we try to give all the reports as international so that you can compare your reports. You don't have to say that, okay, uh, these many copies because I use this system. So some other center can uh, say that my system gives these many copies. So once you use WHO standards or international standards in reporting, it gives a uniform approach and you can compare the results across machines. Preferred sample for testing of CMV is serum and plasma. And uh, usually, if you are sticking on to plasma for testing, then stick on to that when you are monitoring the same patient. Uh, changes in the viral load to a tune of more than one log 10 values are considered as clinically significant because you don't know what is a baseline anemia in that. Because I said that there are certain stress surgical stress, ICU stress, which can create some low level of CMV DNA in a patient. So it is not an infection where anything will mount to infection. You have to be very careful in checking. So important thing is trends in viral loads over a time are more important than any absolute value. And you must have your own cutoffs and audit the clinical outcome, the trigger points for infection. Uh, so Invas tissue invasive disease diagnosis is very uh, easy. You have to establish the diagnosis in a tissue. So we normally, uh, uh, histopathology is the gold standard. You have to look for cytopathic effect, but not very often see. So the expression of CMV antigens by immunohistochemistry is the one which by which they do the uh, uh, testing for CMV infection. You can also look for viral load in the tissue sample, but sometimes it can be a uh, simple colonizer. So you really have to have a very uh, good cutoff to say that beyond this viral load we found like in lung or in GI vein, this is a normal colonizer. So anything more than five log can be indicative of an ongoing active replication rather than one single one. The management, there are two important approaches when we talk of CMV. One is a prophylactic approach in preemptive. So prophylaxis means you are giving, irrespective of the patient, a broad antiviral. It is given to all so that you do not allow the CMV infection to occur. Now, it is a, so if you know in high risk cases where a lot of uh, immunosuppression is going to be offered, you can give uh, CMV as a prophylaxis and you give it with the typical antiviral can cyclovir you can give and uh, that can prevent any occurrence but the only disadvantage is that once you stop this then the CMV can again occur so late onset CMV can occur moreover you can you are exposing a patient uh, it becomes for over treatment there will be an additional cost unnecessary exposure to drug toxicity, which can be there, and your uh, immune reconstitution can be delayed. Preemptive approach, on the other hand, is that we do just routine monitoring for occurrence by doing a viral load testing. And once the infection sets in, you give antiviral to prevent the disease to occur. Now, this way, you are only doing testing. You're not exposing patients to treatment. So I'll explain you what we do in our center. This is a preemptive approach. Most preferred approach, if you are in a low risk setting like liver transplant, you can offer CMV DNA test. So what we do is that immediately after transplant, every week we do monitoring for CMV DNA till about four weeks. And then you do monthly for about three months. And anytime the infection occurs, so like this area, you start CMV treatment depending upon the viral load. Now, if your viral load is uh, 500, 500 to 1000, we just tell the surgeons to reduce immunosuppression. Less than 500, we do not tell them to do any intervention. So we have found a center cutoff as 500 international units per ml. More than 1,000 if you are getting, then CMV specific treatment in the full dose is given. And then they get it done weekly DNA. They stop the treatment once the two DNA comes negative 15 days apart. So we are preventing the CMV disease. So here in the preemptive, we are identifying CMV infection, giving CMV treatment to just a DNA so that proper full-blown CMV disease does not occur, right? So this is a preemptive approach. So this completes about CMV. Another important herpes virus is Epstein-Barr virus. 
which has a more than 90% seroprevalence. So almost all of us in our childhood have got exposed to similarly like CMV by infectious mononucleosis like illness. And this virus persists within the B lymphocytes for life. The important thing is that it can persist at the epithelial cells or B lymphocytes, but can lead to the pathogenesis of post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, and uh, which is uh, in most of 70% uh, of the cases. Now, once the Epstein-Barr virus infection occurs through your oropharyngeal tract, now, there are two types of infection. The virus can go into a lytic infection or latent infection. So, it, like the B cells and epithelial cells, in the lytic infection, the lot of genes are expressed. The lysis is an active replication. So, usually you will have like infectious mononucleosis like syndrome and the virus clears out. But once it resides, it becomes latent. Very few genes are expressed, they become dominant. Now, these genes only uh, and uh, get uh, they, the, these factors only they can lead to B cell proliferation. So, here there is no damage to the cell, however, the B cells themselves start proliferating and then the abnormal proliferation starts and a tumor formation occurs. So, there is no damage to the cells like in the lysis. It's only replication leading to cell transformation and tumor formation. This is the one which is known as post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder. So again, telling you in a simpler way that there is can be lytic or the latent infection. Latent infection can proceed for a long time, but there are certain factors and people are trying to find out that what are the factors which lead to sudden transformation of the silent cells from by which the growth advantage comes. Few inflammatory markers have been found out, but not exact by which the cytogenetic abnormality occurs and medical transformation sets in. So lymph PTLD, which is post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, these are spectrum of diseases which can be from monoclonal, polyclonal lymphoproliferation to aggressive lymphoma because the T cell immunosurveillance to EBV is lost. They are very important causes of morbidity and mortality and can occur in up to 20% of cases quite commonly seen in intestinal and multi-organ transplant and heart transplant and 1 to 5% in liver transplant. Gold standard, however, for this diagnosis is histopathological diagnosis only. I'll tell you what is the role of. So histopathology of that tumor is necessary and then you can classify PTLD into various types and uh, now, clinical presentation of PTLD is that usually it onset is, occurs during the first year and usually after six months following us. So before six months, very rare that such uh, PTLD occurs. The fever malaise and non-specific, but most important is an enlarging mass or a space occupying lesion, which is often detected on a radiological investigation. And there'll be lymph nodes will be enlarged and then you will have a idea that, oh, it can be PTLD. What is the role now in the last few years, one or two years, because a lot of microbiology labs have started doing EBV viral load. Now its significance has started coming. EBV viral load, with the help of EBV viral load, we try to look for EBV DNA in the blood. Earlier, people said that whole blood should be a sample, but uh, not necessary. Plasma and serum are also a very important sample because they tell you a lot about the level of EBV DNA in the body or inside the cells which is coming out. Now, with the help of EBV DNA, it's very, uh, although the DNA can be seen, but if it is progressively rising, then it can give you a lot of information that, okay, the chances of developing a PTLD can be there. However, there are certain cases where a persistent high EBV viral load has been described, but again, uh, which says that it is not associated uh, with the development, but you can always, if you're seeing progressive rise of EBV viral load following six months of a solid organ transplant, always try to keep a check on the patient and tell him that his uh, lymphocyte count should be monitored. And if they're, they're also rapidly rising, then advise an ultrasound or radiological investigation for any space-occupying infection uh, lesion. 
so we do not do universe like in uh, cmb a universal monitoring is mandatory either you use a prophylactic approach or a preemptive it is every, every transplant center has to develop one here it is not mandatory in solid organ transplant however if you, you are high risk that is a donor is exposed and recipient was never exposed to uh, uh, especially in the pediatric age group if a transplant is happening then you have to keep the monitoring done which we do by two to four weeks in first three months the up to six months and then three monthly for rest of uh, for the first one year and every three to six months for three in these patients up to three years you have to do a uh, ebv dna monitoring in such high risk cases so by that you only come get an idea of occurrence of ptl there are other herpes viruses which are very very important like herpes simplex 1 2 varicella zoster 6 7 and 8 and uh, but there are no specific recommendation they we only depend upon the clinical diagnosis herpes simplex 1 and 2 they can lead to the typical although slightly obliterated but they will give you typical mucocutaneous ulcerative disease and uh, mostly within first two months, you can see these lesions. If it is a reactivation, you can also find it out. Uh, most common presentation can be oral labial genital or uh, can disseminate causing like in, uh, you know, pneumonitis. If our herpes simplex encephalitis and meningitis, then DNA PCR is the code. So most of the herpes infections are clinical diagnosis. And you of, do not require uh, viral test uh, load testing in these conditions. However, as a protocol, certain uh, like in our center, they have started getting HSV 1, 2 PCRs done, but it's more of a clinical diagnosis. However, if it is meningitis and cephalitis, then you have to do a CSF PCR because it is a gold standard. Here, I would just like to present two case scenarios of a very zoster infection. This is a 49-year-old man who got uh, two months after a transplant, rash which was limited to a dermatome, painful rash. Uh, the DNA was requested and blood DNA showed presence of VZV and the zero status we investigated, it was recipient was R positive, donor was also R positive. So there is another, so this is a case of herpes zoster, only reactivation. So elderly person who's already this and typical dermatomal even if you have not done and established, you could have given that it is because of the reactivation. Normally, a follow-up is done or they sometimes give uh, immunoglobulins and uh, acyclovir and control this infection. On the other hand, there is a small female, just 15 days transplant, extensive vesicular rash is there, very high uh, VZV DNA in blood and on pre-transplant pre, uh, pre zero status, it was never exposed. So this looks like a pet primary. This requires a lot of monitoring and if their administration of antiviral and uh, immunoglobulin, because this can be uh, can lead to disseminated uh, varicella infection and can be fatal. So this is these are the two uh, type of case scenarios. Usually the reactivation very common in post renal transplant and solid organ transplant, but primary uh, varicella infections can also occur, and that is why pre transplant screening for the immunization, like or the occurrence. Uh, exposure and IgG level is very, very important in case of even the uh, very cellular infections. Another important virus is a BK virus. These are the polyamide group of virus. Usually they found latency in the uroepithelium and renal tubular epithelial cells. So they are associated with post-renal transplant nephropathy or post-bone marrow transplant hemorrhagic cystitis. But uh, you uh, and asymptomatic shedding is there up to 10 percent but what is the trigger trigger in if you're finding bk virus load more than five log copy in blood and or the urinary virus load more than seven log copy then the chances of this nephropathy by bk virus so this is the monitoring approach there are no pre-transplant screening guidelines one has to just keep on monitoring them for any allograft dysfunction or you can do any nephropathy signs there, then you can do monitoring by urine a BK virus PCR. And if it is more than seven, you can go ahead and get a BK virus blood PCR done. If it is increasing more than five log, then uh, the biopsy is done. 
whether it is rejection or a proven BK virus nephropathy, the only thing is that you have to reduce the immunosuppression and keep monitoring for the control of BK virus because 10 person cases, the non-significant BK viremia can be there. So one has to follow it as a algorithm and do a testing for these samples. The respiratory virus is a whole list, uh, which is SARS-CoV-2, influenza, even rhinoviruses, parainfluenza viruses, respiratory syncytial viruses are there, but there uh, depends upon the seasonality. A lot of uh, clinical, so the clinical sign and symptoms slightly obliterated, but uh, more uh, are present and you can see. Uh, so it's a clinical diagnosis or radiological diagnosis. Uh, uh, the thing is that if it is an upper respiratory tract infection, you have to be very, very careful because it can progress up to you know, very wide variation, 7 to 40 percent, you can have uh, pneumonia, full-blown pneumonia will be there. And very often now, because of the COVID and awareness about influenza, uh, respiratory viral testing in post-transplant recipient following prolonged cough or prolonged upper respiratory symptoms is coming. And uh, the treatment uh, option is that you have to prevent only the bacterial uh, secondary bacterial infection. In influenza, you can give Tamiflu. Otherwise, uh, you just have to give a profile, antibiotic prophylaxis, and then monitor, and uh, you can actually treat these infections. Prevention is more important. So influenza vaccination or COVID vaccination, when it was going on, uh, such uh, respiratory viruses can be taken care of. Another important virus which is coming up is hepatitis E virus, especially in the liver transplant. I just wanted to say that HEV was considered to be of acute origin. So sporadic acute hepatitis cause we used to consider HEV and never used to consider it can cause chronic HEV. Now in transplant recipients, especially the genotypes three and four can cause chronic HEV infection. And how we define chronic HEV, if there is presence of HEV replication in blood or stool beyond three months, then we call it chronic HEV. Uh, in India, genotype 1 is the pre dominant type, which is the human type and not the zoonotic type, but that has also is showing a few case reports have come up that that can cause. So in a transplant setting, hepatitis E can cause chronic infection, can lead to cirrhosis, hepatitis, rejection, more often by genotype 3 and 4, but as I said, by genotype 1, few case reports are also coming. And he, there, is, uh, there is a group where the treatment administration for hepatitis B, E has to be started immediately. We have also seen, although we did a, a study and published that for three months as liver transplant, we did not see any case of chronic HEV, but off late, there are case reports, 2K or 2 or 3 case reports which have come up that genotype 1 can also cause uh, chronic HEV infection. So this is one new virus you have to be careful in monitoring. In transplant setting, we try to uh, have a syndromic testing because you cannot identify the pathogen so that a particular uh, organ where it is causing should be targeted. Multiplexing PCR should be used, which should have a rapid turnaround time. But one has to be very careful that it should be affordable, quality assured test. And we cannot make a post-transplant patient go from one corner to, a, to the other of the hospital for identifying the pathogen. So at one shop stop, all for all should be there. And so syndromic testing is preferred. So I just uh, conclude my presentation that uh, in a transplant for transplant in associated infections, pre-transplant evaluation of recipient donor is very, very important. Post-transplant lab diagnosis requires very careful evaluation of the pre-transplant zero status. What is the exposure? What is the timeline of occurrence? How will you differentiate between reactivation and primary? So a cutoff threshold should be there. Selection of tests is very, very important. And nowadays, mostly all of us have agreed to PCR and real-time PCR-based methods. Multiplexing should be done and monitoring uh, for transplant recipient for common viral infection should be done because as we've seen from first months to 12 months and beyond, it is the viral infections which uh, pose a lot of uh, uh, you know, danger to these transplant recipients. So I thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Sonal. Thank you, Dr. Ita.
Rajiv, because this is a question which is very, very common in their question paper. And uh, I have seen it all across the board, whether it is PDCC, DNB or MD, this is a very, very important question. So I'm sure everybody would have uh, benefited. And uh, there are a few questions for you, Ekta. One is that EBV and adenoviremia in HASCT treatment. I think you did cover a little bit about it in the talk, but maybe if you would like to stress. EBV and adenoviremia in hemopoietic cell cell treatment. Uh, uh, as I told We've you, lost you, Ekta. You've become mute. I have. No, you're not audible. I don't know what am, happened. Am I audible now? Am I audible? Maybe I have lost you. Can others hear? Can you put it in the chat Can you box? Hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. I think I have lost it. Ah. Uh, so the something wrong with my. I have not touched hemopoietic stem cells transplant. Because that's an entire different story. As I said, that the pre-engraftment is very, very important. And because of the severe neutropenia, pre-mucosal and mucoablative therapy, which is given, a lot of uh, 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 bacterial pathogens, they take, uh, you know, uh, lead into that. EBV per se, as I have discussed, is... EB, we never treat EBV deanemia. Nobody treats EBV. EBV deanemia or presence of EBV in blood is just to monitor, give an alarming uh, sign immediately to your uh, uh, surgeons that, okay, boss, now B cell proliferation can happen. You would start doing uh, radiological scans. You start following the limit. For city uh, count. EBV, D, uh, if PTLD occurs, GAN cyclovir, which is antiviral, is not recommended. You have to give dituximab. You have to give chemo chemotherapy to stop the uh, neoplasm. So EBV is a virus which can cause tumor. Treatment is for the tumor. Because virus is there in the B lymphocyte, it, you will not be able to target by your GAN cyclovir. So recommending ribavirin GAN cyclovir is not there. This is an, uh, was the first question. Uh, adenovirus, yes. Adenovirus uh, is a problem now. Everywhere is talking about, uh, especially in liver-related adenovirus-associated uh, liver failure is happening. We really need to have uh, good data. We did a study with one of my PDCCs for three months to look for adenoviremia in our tra transplant setting, and we did not find much prevalence but now with the cases so the case reports are coming from the west in india the hepatic liver failure is more by a and e and a by in children we still have not got adenovirus associated liver failure in our setting so that is why i said that what west is putting up literature we have to check cross check in our setting we cannot be 100% uh, sure that now adenoviruses started coming from abroad. We should start looking. We should be aware of it. We should have technology, but we should generate evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Ekta. The other is, uh, somebody wants to know what is the pre-transplant work of a latent tuberculosis? Okay. Uh, since I am not very expert <laughs> in tuberculosis, but I think they look for active infection, uh, maybe they are doing with the Montus, they must be doing all the markers to look for the exposure. They, they do. It is there. So we, the some... target is you're looking for also you can add on Dr. Sonal into it. How are we doing? No, we have a very, very distinguished guest who's joined. Dr. Kamala, can I please request you to answer this? Yeah, Sonal. Hi, Ekta. Excellent talk. Thoroughly Thank enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we do quantiferon. We do, uh, you know, we do the quantiferon gold as a must for all our pre-transplants. Not that we're doing great transplants, but we do it as a, as a you know, as a pre-transplant. Definitely we do it. Okay. And and ma'am, uh, then are they, uh, are they given an ATT cover if they are found? No, no, for... no. We don't give it. Exactly. We don't give it. We, we okay. just watch it and we know what is the patient said he's infected. 
we then look for active disease subsequently. But it is a baseline uh, test that we do In for our time. Yeah. Okay. I don't think there are any more questions. Uh, how is how to balance the risk of transplant rejection and reduction of viral load? Yeah, so that is why, as I showed you, the CMV guidelines. So each center, the role of microbiology is very, very important. You have to, first two years goes in data generation and it, uh, this is what I did in our transplant center. So I can tell you from CMB, that is why a cutoff threshold of 500, I have said, less than 500, nothing to worry. 500 to 1000, I tell them, please reduce immunosuppression, mm -hmm. monitor, okay. CMB gets controlled on its own. It can be just a silent, but if it goes beyond 1000, then I always tell them, please start your uh, gancyclovir full dose, monitor till it clears. But there are certain then cer certain times, it's an everyday reporting. My surgeons come to me that, Ekta's, look, this is a small patient, very precious transplant. Should we start? Then I said, you do your clinical judgment. You can start antiviral. Keep monitoring the viral load. If it shows uh, a downtrend and you're not developing toxicity, you can stop the antiviral. So this is a call, I think, microbiologists, surgeons, take together. I cannot tell you about the guidelines. The guidelines, they say, just monitor your own cutoff threshold and uh, do. So this is how we do in our center. It's uh, everyday discussion between our clinicians and us. Okay. Thank you, Ekta. And thank you, Kamala, ma'am, for that answer. I think it has answered. Few people have asked again on latent TB, but ma'am has already answered. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you so much, Ekta, for a very, very interesting session and a very thorough session. Mm -hmm. And if there are no more questions, we'll close this month and see you again next month on the third Friday. Okay. Thank you so thank much, you. Ekta. Thank again. you so much, Dr. Sabha. Thank you, ma'am, Dr. Uh, Kamila, ma'am. Bye. Bye-bye.